I'm Gavin Ashenden. Welcome to Catholic Unscripted, episode number one. Well, there we are. We changed the name. It used to be Anglican Unscripted. What have you been up to, Gavin? Well, no, Anglican Unscripted is a different brand, and it, it was, belongs to the splendid Kevin Carlson who set it up. Um, and I was lucky enough to be involved with it for a while. But my period of involvement coincided with uh, a rather exciting time in my life when I found myself becoming a Roman Catholic. And um, uh, I think that one of the things that helps a church is to have conversations that overlap from the different spiritualities and denominations. But I think there are limits probably to um, the way, way that's possible. So here we have uh, an unscripted conversation intended to take a, a look at the news that's going on and current affairs. But I think in particular to bring what I hope is a level of theological and spiritual discernment to what's going on. What, what is the Holy Spirit saying to us today, to the church? And, and um, to say Catholic, I think here, certainly means Roman Catholic. I've become Roman Catholic. But there are, it also, of course, Catholicos is universal. So in the same way that the, the creed is the one holy Catholic church. Yes, that, um, that, oh, that, that confuses a lot of people, doesn't it, in the Anglican service. We say that liberally in an Anglican service, and we think, oh, we're not Catholics, but it does mean universal. It does. I, I, actually, from my present perspective, I'm, I'm rather critical of Anglicanism in that I, I think it stopped being Catholic and it stopped being apostolic. Um, and the reason for that is it, it, it reconstituted itself in the 16th century and, and broke the link with the development from the apostles. I mean, that's why Newman did what I did, because he looked and saw that the link had been broken with some rather serious consequences, not just for the, um, for the validity of the sacraments, but also because the reformers had lost touch with the ecumenical councils of the church. So I, I think one of the great dangers of the, the problems of staying within a reformed movement is that um, you develop a degree of amnesia about how the Holy Spirit has led the church. Now, if you don't believe the Holy Spirit has led the church, down the centuries, then, then you, you, you live with the amnesia and you go back to the, to the Bible uh, and, and you start again. But, I, but if the Holy Spirit has led the church, as he promised he would, as Jesus promised he would, then you get a distorted faith. And I think it's, it's moving away from that distortion towards uh, a, a holistic understanding of the development of the church that has drawn me historically back into the mother church, Roman Catholicism. Well, ha having said that, I mean, the famous um, saying in a lot of churches is that there we have scripture, there we have the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit will never, uh, as it were, go against scripture. Uh, now, some accusations have been made against the Catholic Church that it's come up with some peculiar things that don't really accord with the original scriptures. Yes, I think from outside the Catholic Church, I think it can look like that. But in fact, of course, the whole Catholic tradition has been scrupulous to be consistent with scripture. Um, I mean, for example, some people write to me, so you can't possibly believe in purgatory. And I say, well, um, first of all, I, I find in Maccabees that you need to pray for the dead. Oh, but Maccabees isn't part of the Bible. Well, it was until the reformers cut it out unilaterally. <laughs> what gave the reformers the right to chop the Bible out when it doesn't agree with them? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it's also in 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where St. Paul talks about the day when uh, we find ourselves purged of all the extraneous stuff that is not silver and gold. Now, um, that, that's, not, that's not specific teaching about the existence of purgatory but it's certainly consistent with the experience of Christians as they prayed. So if you take this lineal understanding of the church's development, um, and you have to take in the experience of Christians, one of the things we do is we set it against scripture and against each other. But um, uh, the whole point about the Holy Spirit is that he has brought illumination and wisdom, which the rest of the church has tested, always against scripture. Uh, and so the development of the Catholic Church has been it rooted in scripture and and very scrupulously tested against deception it's certainly true it's gone wrong from time to time when they started trying to build st peter's and <laughs> and demanding people pay taxes to do it with time yeah. off purgatory 
they, they, took, they took a good idea and they made a bad idea out of it and were quite rightly called back, called back yeah. to their roots. Some people would call that pr practical Christianity. I mean, the, the thing needed to be built and therefore those uh, various ways of doing it. I tell you why I say that is that the, one or two things have happened recently and the, uh, the dreaded virus has really been a bit of a, a purging virus in many respects. Um, we refer to the Anglican Church, which is going through extraordinary difficult times, a lot more than the Catholic Church. Um, before I hit on the, the virus thing properly, uh, why is that, do you think? Why are the Anglican Church struggling, both numerically and some people would say spiritually at the moment? Well, you're raising a, a really a very, a very big question. And um, if I can make it more personal, this is not about me, but a, no a number of people have said to me, uh, Gavin, you're just, by, by moving from Anglicanism into the Catholic Church, although it is the mother church, you're jumping from frying pan into the fire. And the answer is, yes, I know that, because the, the, the affliction that the, the Anglican Church is suffering from, which has taken some of the stuffing and the or integrity out of it, is of course afflicting the Catholic Church. So what you'll find in both churches are people, and I suppose the simplest thing is you can say, who are, who are uh, adapting themselves to the spirit of the age. We might look in a moment at the Cardinal Archbishop of Chicago, who says that prayer and the coronavirus don't really have anything to do with each other. But what we've got in, in um, I, and I, <laughs> at this point I've become quite cross, I, I can't, when the Archbishop of Canterbury and York closed all the churches in the UK, they did it not because the government asked them to, but because they said they were setting a good example, uh, a good civic example. Now, of course, Christians set good civic examples. We, we are the creators of, of, of the Kivitas. Society is based, as Tom Holland has uh, so clearly demonstrated in his book, Dominion, on Christian values. But, the, but there comes a point where being a good citizen can't take precedence over honouring God. Um, otherwise, the early Christians would have sprinkled uh, incense at the feet of the idols of the emperor because they were being good citizens. But, mm. but you can't do that if it comes into conflict with Jesus. Now, I, I, I'm quite convinced in my own mind and heart that worshipping God uh, together uh, in churches around the altar is one of the most serious priorities we have. And I think for the archbishops to say, we're going to close the doors to the churches, even though the government haven't required us to, in order to, 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 to put pressure on Christians to, to model good citizenship is a complete betrayal of the gospel a, and a submission to this spirit of the age, to secularism. Why is the Anglican church in trouble? Because by succumbing to feminism and relativism and cultural Marxism, all these isms that are ranged against authentic Christianity. They've, they've become a different belief system. Well, you've got a, a strange comparison there because for oh, many years now, uh, the uh, feminist movement in uh, America has been gaining, even within the Catholic Church, especially with the uh, religious, uh, the nuns. Uh, now, um, the Pope is this uh, autumn going to America and he's been breathing uh, sweetness, light and love about this group of um, women nuns that seem to be saying, well, we want to uh, be a bit more dynamic. We're more interested in social issues now. Um, and even abortion has been raised at the Catholic Church, of course, is very hot and remains hot against abortion. But is this a bit of acquiescence and preparing for an easy journey um, for the Pope when he goes this autumn? Well, the question of feminism is an enormously difficult one. And during my lifetime, I've been raised to acknowledge feminism. No one can say they're not a feminist without getting into serious trouble. The assumption is you must be a chauvinist or you support the patriarchy. But of course, feminism comes in a variety of different shapes, even, not even, but I mean, feminists themselves talk about at least three waves. Uh, and this isn't the moment for a lecture on feminism, but as I've thought more and more about it, as feminism has developed, it's, it's done two things. It's brought a degree of antipathy between the sexes or the genders. Uh, 
which is deeply unwelcome and unchristian, um, hatred and anger and, 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 uh, and the need for reparation and revenge. And at the same time, it's brought in a series of values, one of, one of which abortion is out from, that again are deeply unchristian. And I'm afraid, I think, that it's time for Christians to say we don't believe in feminism. It's a, it, it turns out it's a vanguard of, of the cultural Marxist project from which other things flow. Uh, and it's very difficult in our society nowadays to say, I am not a feminist. I think feminism is causing theological and spiritual harm. But the whole movement for the ordination of women is, of course, based upon it. Uh, and you bring in the Pope, and I'm reluctant. It would be silly of me to criticize the Pope. <laughs> but, um, but I think, uh, I, I think there's a challenge on the church to be able to distinguish between movements that are from God and those that are against him. And I think this, this one is, is too uh, infiltrated, it's not a very good word, but it, it contains elements that are so anti-Christian that they're, they're dangerous for the church. But there are very few voices in the church that have dared to look at it and to, to make those distinctions. Yes, yeah, so strange things happening. We've highlighted this on uh, another program in the past that um, Spain has been hit uh, as hard, uh, nearly as hard as, as Italy. Uh, but the strange thing about Spain, of course, is that maybe because of the history and the uh, machismo of the uh, past machismo of the Spanish, the women's movement has, has certainly had fruitful ground there. And um, true also that politically Spain is well to the left and has had to deal with uh, the communist basic party and has become extremely left. And at the beginning of the virus, uh, before it hit properly, um, they were warned not to allow a big uh, women's uh, uh, international day march in Madrid, uh, every other European country said, you can't do things like that at this state, but they allowed it. And even worse than that, because the prime minister's wife who was leading the processions, uh, she got hold of the virus on mother-in-law and it spread like wildfire. And people said, well, oh, surely it couldn't spread, but in a kissy, kissy country, as Southern Europe is, golly, it spreads. And we now find out that 75 other marches took place on that date. Wow, um, reaping the whirlwind, or is that a bit unfair? Well, it might be unfair, but it, but it, does, it does look a bit obvious, doesn't it? I mean, it, it just so happened that, that this particular group of people turned out to be the vehicle that, that has caused more infection in Spain than anything else. I, think, I don't think I want to, make, to go down the road of making a direct connection, because... Um, I, I'd rather make the ideological connection. I mean, it, as it happened, having those marches at that time in those circumstances was disastrous. But I think the danger with, with pushing that is that um, people will say, well, okay, but that, but that was a, you know, that was just an event. Uh, it was historical coincidence. Uh, I, I think what we ought to do instead is to look at feminism, its content and, and the quality of its philosophy and say, the, the wherever you have feminism like this, you have something antipathetic to Christianity, and you don't need to you don't need to rely on marches having taken place at a particular juncture in a pandemic to prove it. Uh, I think we go back to basics and we we look at the beliefs and say um, we we didn't know it to begin with because we thought this was about equality, restitution, um, even complementarity, but it turned out it wasn't. It turned out it was a Trojan horse of a philosoph philosophical kind, which uh, has seen Christianity essentially as an enemy and, and changed it accordingly. What, I'm, what I find most problematic, for example, about the outcome for women priests is that almost all the women clergy are, are feminists first and Christians second, and they require their Christianity to be contoured to their feminism rather than the other way around. I think that's that's one of the great disasters that has afflicted the church in the 20th century. And, and the, you know, the feminist movement within Catholicism has yet to notice that. Yeah, it's, um, it's very difficult. Uh, Jesus got it right, as he, he usually does, um, when he walked this earth and, and, and really venerated and upheld 
many women through the scriptures and through his three-year ministry. And uh, Mary eventually uh, was decided by the, uh, uh, the early church to, um, not to be put on a pedestal exactly, but to be given her right position. You're quite right, and very few people take a holistic view of the gender relations in the, in the New Testament. Uh, our, our Lord was revolutionary in the way in which he treated all human beings, and especially women. But one of the things that's overlooked is he came to, to, to allow us to, have, to introduce us to the Father. The Holy Spirit comes to allow us to call out Abba, Daddy. Um, and as C.S. Lewis pointed out so cogently, a God who is father at the heart of me becomes a very different God from one who is mother. But what we've, what we've got is that under the influence of feminism, we have um, an antipathy to fatherhood. So if you would say to evangelistically now to, to, to a girl's school, for example, Jesus has come to introduce you to the father. Feminism has made fatherhood a toxic, uh, given it a toxic quality. Mm -hmm. The great, problem at the moment in our society is absent fathers. Uh, fatherhood has become a, a reprehensible thing almost and, and therefore there's this enormous barrier to evangelism. It's very difficult to do what Jesus did and say you can be reconciled to your heavenly father. Well that's a consequence of the ideology of feminism that is implicit and again isn't spoken about very much but it's really quite serious. So we go a stage further and say uh, and we hear this every day of the week almost. Oh, it's my feminine side coming out, says the man. You go along with that. <laughs> um, I spent a lot of time thinking very carefully about this in my Jungian period, <laughs> which, was about, which lasted about 20 years. Um, and, and, and Jung did exactly this. He tried to fuse the masculine and the feminine into a kind of an amorphous uh, human anthropology. Um, no, I, I don't. I, I think there, is a, there are gentle and humane ways of being a man, and there are powerful, uh, and they don't make you a feminine man, and there are powerful uh, and, and energetic ways of being a woman, and they don't make you a masculine woman. Uh, I think, so this is a huge area of, of nature and nurture, you know, what, what is hormonal and DNA uh, and chemical and what is cultural, and that's actually the heart of one of the arguments we're having at the moment. Third wave feminism insists everything is cultural and can be, can be conditioned. And I think, I think Christians look back and say, no, we have to have a degree of nature in this. God has made men and women uh, similar but different as part of a humanity. So as we try and balance nature and nurture, I think Christians can't give up nature and move straight into the feminist nurture and, and, and cultural culturally orientated philosophy. It's one of, the, one of the ways we part company with the present movement of, of uh, cultural Marxism. The virus is uh, coming back again in, in many other terms because a lot of the uh, administration work, which is conducted by ladies, of course, um, they're at home and they're looking after the kids and still working. One wonders what will happen. Uh, do the women really need to go out to work as much as they do or is it for social stroke domestic purposes. Um, one wonders, I've seen certain figures about the actual uh, value of men and women and how much men and women get paid in, um, a, a, in an employer situation. There's only so much money in a company, so you can look at the money that is available to pay wages. Uh, and then you look how much is going out to men, how much is going out to women, and uh, the favourite argument, of course, in all this is that I need to go out to work uh, to bolster the financial viability uh, and help my husband to do this. Now, is it going to be turned on its head, that philosophy? If we put everything into the, the pot, the cost of nurseries, uh, and every government seems very uh, keen at the moment about getting um, women back to work, even though they're working at home, uh, they still want them to look after the children. There's a whole social consequence of this virus. You've raised some immensely complicated issues and, and fools rush in where angels fear to tread and many angels fear to tread where, where we've just gone. Um, I think the only thing that's really clear to me is that 
uh, that there's a great conflict between work and motherhood. So, I mean, I, I see capitalism as being the enemy here more than anything else. Capitalism is rather, is ruthless. It, it gobbles people up. It treats them as units of production. Um, and in order to be free, women entered the workplace, but the workplace was dominated by capitalism, although well, the socialism is, of course, doesn't, doesn't change the dynamics. And so the question is, how can you be, how can you be a worker and a mother? Um, and the answer is very simple. Well, you delegate mothering to the state. But, but that's the great fear, I think, of Christians, that the state becomes a parent. Uh, and we, we either have absent fathers and delegated motherhood, uh, or, we, or we try and model things differently. One of the ways in which some Christian women have modeled things differently is by saying, my, my, my motherhood comes first. But it's very difficult now to, to pay the mortgage with one salary. Mm. So here the conflict essentially is between, between capitalism and parenthood. Um, and and we, we found no way of resolving that. Not yet, we haven't indeed. Maybe the virus has. No, that's taking things a bit too far. No, no, I think I no, I don't know. I do. I mean, you raised that, and I didn't bite at it because I, because I don't think I understand. But 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 let let. But it was very clever of you and uh, and perceptive, and so so let the fact that I couldn't answer it not mask, not mask the the, the your your perception in raising it. I think the virus. People are asking what how it's going to be different after the virus. I think you're quite right in saying that the home working that has emerged from it and the way in which that affects men and women is, is going to, um, it's going to shake things up. And I, I can't see how, what the outcome is going to be yet, but you're right. There's going to be a shake up. Things will change a bit. Mm. Cardinal Kupic has been rather outspoken, has he not, over in uh, North America, um, saying, um, you know, you're not going to get rid of this virus by praying about it. You've got to be more practical. Yes, well, we're back to the spirit of the age thing again. This is, um, uh, uh, Anglicans have not been particularly uh, vocal in terms of understanding how the spiritual life might intersect with the virus. Um, and I think Cardinal Cooper, I'm afraid, is channeling the spirit of the age here. One of the things that, again, drew me to Catholicism was a group of holy women who um, uh, who had had private revelations. Now, private revelations are are a very dangerous thing, and the church is quite rightly wary of them. But there are a few outstanding ones. And one of the things that we see in the last hundred years is a relationship um, within the prophetic uh, culture between our behaviour and things that go wrong. So Our Lady said at Fatima. Uh, there is a direct link between the behavior of the church and the world uh, and war. And if you don't repent, you will find that the First World War, which you've just experienced, will be followed by another one, uh, equally disastrous. Um, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, so much so that historians have started talking about one war, uh, which was just interrupted by a few years of peace between 1918 and 1939. Uh, Our Lady also then said, that if you don't consecrate Russia to my sacred heart, it will cause an enormous amount of damage. And the church couldn't be persuaded to do that until 1984. Five years after it did it, the Soviet Union fell. And now, 35 years or so later, 71% of Russians self-identify as Christians. Well, um, it's a brave person who, who then says, in the light of some of these uh, some of these experiences, there is no link between our moral behavior and our prayer and human events. I think the way I understand the virus is, of course, it's a natural virus. It's a natural evil. But we are we're poised in a world where good and evil fight and, and we have agency between them. And to the extent that we repent and we are on the side of the good, we find ourselves with a degree of natural projection from from natural disasters. Uh, no, no disaster is theologically neutral. <laughs> At the very least, they cause evil. And I, I think that we, the way I hear the private revelations um, and Catherine Emmerich, the most, the most marvelous nun in the 19th century, foresaw uh, the, the age of two popes, foresaw plagues, foresaw uh, great turbulence for the Christian community. 
and warns us always these things can be changed by prayer and repentance. So it's, it's a shame when you have a cardinal saying, um, trying to break the link between human capacity and moral accountability uh, and the way in which war, plague, famine and pestilence affect us. The book of Revelation suggests it's on the side of, of, of Fatima <laughs> uh, and, and, and visions. Yes, it, um, I don't know, perhaps you should become an Anglican. Oh, that's very unfair of me. Uh, but you know, this is where we are in, with churchmanship at the moment. Um, apart from uh, the virus, which is uh, bred fear, one looks at the standard of journalism, the standard of news reporting. Uh, a lot of the news reporting I find at the moment starts not with an accurate statement of truth, uh, but you're immediately whisked into a ward watching an old person taking his last breath, and that's the start of the news. Now, we have gone seriously astray, uh, or have we? We are personalizing it. Uh, if you wish, we're pointing out the true tragedy. Should we be doing that? Well, can I change the question a bit? Because again, I don't know the answer to that, but I've been astonished at the level of fear that's being peddled through the mainstream media. I don't watch the news much. I don't have a television, but I, uh, I, I tend to listen to uh, the Sky newspaper review and read, read a couple of papers as well as journals. But, but if, you, if you turn on uh, any of the news channels, um, the ones I get on the internet, you're bombarded by fear. And people have been saying that the government intended to terrify us with the virus, to mm. force us into compliant behavior. But now their problem as they look to start the economy up is they've so terrified us that people are, are skulking at home and unwilling to, to go back into the, to the world of work and, and take it up. So I've no doubt at all that the state has been peddling fear through the media. Uh, and I think to, to, to great effect. And so, I mean, my, my last, the, the sermon that I put out for, my, for, for Easter, I thought, what, what is the Lord saying to us through the resurrection? I thought the most important thing he was saying was don't be afraid. Mm. We, we Christians should not be afraid. We shouldn't be afraid of death. We shouldn't be afraid of dying. We shouldn't be af afraid of, of, of condemnation and not fitting in. There's a great sense that people are ill at ease with, with who they are, body image, social image, political image. I think the great thing about being a Christian is that we're liberated from these two very, very toxic fears, de death and, uh, uh, and a degree of alienation from who we are. So um, uh, I think Christians have the antidote in their faith to this social assault and manipulation by the government. But it's a very serious phenomenon at the moment. And again, I think as churches, we should call it out. I, I think that, you know, I'd like to hear bishops saying to the government, don't terrorize the people. This is, this is a bad thing to do. You have no right to, to, to try and achieve social compliance yeah. through, through uh, media terrorism. Yeah. We're in an age of risk aversion. Uh, one looks at yeah. the internet and uh, you have to do a risk assessment before you do anything in the workplace now uh, maybe that'll spread to the army oh do i shoot that uh, person that's about to shoot me let me do a risk uh, well i it, it can go into the absurd um, okay. but, um we don't gamble as christians uh we got certain truths and uh, assurances that that we rely on but does that go and stretch? Because I was um, entertained is the wrong way, but I was speaking to a colleague over in America um, a few days ago, and he happened to say, oh, well, I was in church at Easter. I said, well, did you not get a lockdown? Well, it depends where you are in America. Now, we, we don't get the truth about America so often mm. in our, our media, either about Trump personally or about what is going on out there. And he said, well, most places, uh, because America's a big place, they, it, it's not New York where the virus really has taken hold. There's very few places that you cannot go. So the churches were opened at Easter. And we got on to talking about the, the cup, uh, the bread, in a communion mass service. And he says, you still don't share the same cup do you well certainly in the anglican church the cup is passed round that's a recipe for disaster surely 
What should we be doing in your estimation, Gavin? Well, if my history is right, one of the reasons that the Catholic Church began to give communion in one kind largely was, was as a response to plague. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a romantic, and so I would like to think that the, that the cup brought you a degree of protection, but my science isn't good enough to know that. And so I think, um, I, I think first of all, communion should be taken in one kind. One should take all the sensible precautions that the hygienists tell us of. My, my concern is that the, 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 the bishops have been uh, over-egging it and going much further. So, for example, the, the Bishop of um, Bishop Peter Baldacino in the Diocese of Las Cruces has opened up his churches. And the governor has said, well, you can have people into church for mass, but no more than five at a time. Sure. And he said, great, well, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. So, yeah. so yeah. masses now happen with, <laughs> with a maximum... Well, if they were happening here, I'd be at the head of the queue. I'd, I'd, I'd wait all night to get to get back to the Eucharist. Let there be a hundred masses a day. You can't cope with that. Let, let there be a hundred masses a day. Um, we've been talking for a long time now about about church reduction in numbers. Uh, I'd, I'd like to see other bishops being as brave as this bishop and saying, uh, okay, if, if the government say we can only have five people at a time, we'll have five people at a time, but we will open the doors of the churches. Uh, and 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 do it like that. Um, so I, I think this is one of the one of the really serious issues of of of, of the moment. And I was listening to uh, Tom Holland and Luke Copplestone, I think, the editor of the Catholic Herald, talk on a podcast. And Tom was saying that um, he thinks that one of the things that will come out of is a sense by the laity that the bishops, the shepherds, really let them down. They, the, both Anglican and Catholic. That, that they took the side, they unnecessarily reacted uh, on the side of the hygienists and the, and the government instead of, uh, and, and abandoned their, their first principle of, of being shepherds to the sheep. You know, both, there the can be ways of keeping the churches open and people safe from contamination. Uh, they didn't even try. So here we have bishops now this particular bishop trying, and all credit to him. I hope other bishops will begin to see that their first duty to Jesus in celebrating the Eucharist and to the people in providing them with the sacraments uh, can be fulfilled without becoming bad citizens and without putting people in, in danger. Yeah. Let's um, change direction a little bit. Uh, we, we've got to refer to um, Cardinal Pell who for the last uh, five years has been in uh, horrendous problems, in jail indeed. Um, the Australian judiciary found against him, and now they've found very much for him. And as in many of these cases, uh, sometimes it's the untestified testimony of, in this case, uh, an underaged uh, male child, um, that swung the day and put the uh, cardinal in jail. Always smoke and fire here, one thinks of, um, has he got off on a, a judicial uh, loophole? Uh, or should we be very careful about these people that keep saying, oh, I was um, in another circumstance, I was uh, sexually assaulted 30 years ago. Um, golly, what good memories some people have. Um, what do we do about things like this? Is it mischievous? I think the Pell thing is, is, is enormously alarming. Um, I responded to supporters of, of Cardinal Pell in the public media and said we believed in him. This was very difficult because it looked as though you were supporting a convicted paedophile. Well, of all, all the things you could do today to, uh, to, to, to threaten your social credibility supporting a convicted paedophile is right near the, the top of the list but as you looked at the facts it, it was impossible to believe he was guilty um the, the first jury couldn't make up their mind the second jury found him guilty after some time but 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 um the high court eventually said no same jury should have done the court of appeal found against him two to one two civil lawyers and the the, the one dissenting lawyer was a criminal judge. The fact, when you look at the facts, um, it, it was impossible, literally, literally impossible by any criteria whatsoever for him to have done what he did. 
uh, this isn't the moment for me to go to go through it. Andrew Bolt of Sky TV in Australia has a a, a very useful article uh, interview with him on YouTube at the moment. But but if but but the facts being what they are, uncontrovertible facts, he couldn't have done it. So so what was going on? Pell said several times this should not have been a referendum on the Catholic Church in Australia, which failed to deal with paedophilia lamentably, as the whole Catholic Church has done. Although I should say that, that, that this is not so much a crisis of Catholicism, it's a crisis of homosexuality. Uh, a certain kind of homosexuality entered the church in the mid-20th century, and these crimes against children uh, are the outcome of it. And as he said, it's now been rooted out by the Catholic Church. It took too long and caused too much damage. But it's hard to believe that Pell wasn't found guilty as a form of punishment for the Catholic Church. What's terrifying is that um, it took several rounds of the Australian common law judicial system until the obvious fact of his innocence was proclaimed and he was set free. Uh, seven judges to zero said he could not possibly have done it. The, the, the legal system has miscarried from the point at which the police began to try and stitch him up through the jury system, through the court of appeal, until you know finally the high court uh, came to this verdict and put everything in the public place. But during this time, uh, the Australian Broadcasting Company, the ABC, made it their business to hang Pell in public, only ever giving one side. Uh, and, and the whole media moved against him. So I think what the Pell thing ought to do is to al alarm us, not only for his own sake, but to, but to, to be a wake-up call to the church that there is a, a, a very powerful... Uh, resentment against Christians in the public space and the legal system was only just able to save uh, this this public Christian by the skin of its teeth. My fear is what comes later um, and, and I hope that people will kick up as much fuss as they can about this, this dreadful miscarriage of justice in order to try and keep both the police and the legal system not only in Australia but, but throughout the civilized world within behind the boundaries of what is true uh, and what is what is just uh, kevin we're going to um bring things to a close um with some breaking news uh and that is um statistics uh, we've had um for many weeks now statistics that are as true as one can get they come from various sources about how the virus is affecting every country and of course there's the um the bar chart, uh, predictive charts, all sorts of things. Very complicated. You've got to be a statistician, which is complicated enough to understand these things. But um, one thing that we've noticed is that, and everybody's noticed, of course, that there is a hump in the number of um, charts that, and, and that, in generally speaking, they're starting to go down a bit. There's hiccups along the way. Then one looks down and say, at China's chart, my goodness me. And it is so different from every other chart. Uh, it's ludicrous. It's clearly obvious that 3,400 people didn't die in China. Actually, the breaking news today, they've admitted, oh, well, it could have been double that. Uh, well, if one counts the um, number of urns that were sent to uh, uh, occupy uh, ashes, uh, 3,500 a day, that, that sum is 40 odd thousand. It's ludicrous. And you can see possibly how the world is free or free to speak truthfully. One can look at the US and they're the only ones brave enough to put the number of testing, uh, testings um, in each particular state in America. Everything seems very open in America compared with the rest of the world. Dare one even say, and I'm going to tease you now, there is one stat that's perhaps the most important stat, and that's uh, the number of people that have been treated for the virus and the number of deaths. Now, to give you an example, here in uh, Portugal, uh, that's 3%, which is quite low. It happens to be the same in America, and people say, oh, they're all dying in America. Well, they are in New York, but the rest of America isn't it. It's very low, the success ratio of people who are surviving this, and whether they're being treated 
uh, on the quiet, as I'm sure they are, with a drug that is put out there, which has been ridiculed, but it seems to be working in conjunction with another drug, which we won't mention the name of, uh, that the fullness of the truth of that will come out in time. You go to countries like Italy and you go to countries like Spain uh, and you go to countries like Britain and it's 12 and 13 percent people dying of those that are being treated. That's alarmingly high. Uh, dare I say I've got a little sight, little spot on the map that says holy see and it's unique. Do you know how many people have died or even been treated? Gavin, zero percent. Now is this another real figure or is it another Chinese figure? <laughs> Rodney, I have absolutely no idea. That's <laughs> extraordinary. Um, I, I'm keeping my eye on Iceland and Sweden because they, they, these are the countries that have uh, been much more modest about the way in which they've enforced lockdown, mm. thinking that the information we had was, 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 was too partial and misunderstood. Um, I, I don't know. I, I mean, so I think the point you're making is that we're not being given enough facts and truth. My, one of my concerns is that if this follows the trajectory of Spanish flu, we will may have a second and third wave, Ooh. which are more lethal than the first one. Mm. Uh, and, and the fear is that, um, that having d destroyed our economy for the first one, we've made a false economy in a sense, because we're, we're going to have to pay at any at any rate, you know, if you you may well defend the NHS and that your health service now, but if you destroy your economy, you won't be able to defend your health service in ten years' time, because you you won't have the resources to sustain it. Um, again, I think the the overriding issue, since I'm not an economist and not an epidemiolo epidemiologist, uh, is is truth. Um, we're not being given the truth, and. Uh, my great anxiety is the way in which civil liberties have been surrendered so quickly. I feel that so far from, I don't think the Queen was right, people won't say this was a strong generation. This seems to me to have been an infantilized generation that, that ran into the skirts of Mother State and said, save us from death. Do anything you can, but save us from death. Mm. Uh, and the antidote to that is the gospel, the resurrection of Jesus. Yeah. This ought to be a moment when the church gathers itself up and says, we have the antidote, not to the virus, but, but to the plague of fear that you're succumbing to. Yeah. My favorite scripture, of course, is Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And people uh, go heavy on uh, life and the way. They forget about the truth. But certainly in journalistic terms, this is what we really need, um, as you've just said. Gavin, time has passed us. And um, we look forward to having another chat next week. We have really got to leave it there. Thank you for your wit and wisdom. And uh, we'll see you next week. Rodney, thank you for making this possible. Um, you've been listening to Catholic Unscripted, episode number one. Let's hope there's an episode number two. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.